welcome, welcome, welcome to Health Issues. I'm your host, Chris Sylvain, and uh, believe me, I'm personally excited about today. Uh, really am. We have an awesome guest for you uh, today, and uh, somebody that you probably all know, uh, you've read about, and, uh, and may have seen, because he's been doing a lot of interviews also, but we're excited, honored to have Mr. Jarvis DeBerry. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, definitely an, a pleasure and an honor for us. Um, Literally a dominant force in the city right now. You know, I talked talk to him about it before. Real humble guy. So, he, um, but um, uh, you know, we know about your thoughts, your background. We get a chance to kind of wake up in the morning. You know what I mean? And, and click online uh, to read it online, or or, um, or when we get the paper, you know, we get a chance to pull it out. But yeah. who is Mr. Jarvis DeBerry? I know you grew up in Mississippi. I grew up in Mississippi. Okay. And I've been in New Orleans since 1997. Yeah, that's what so, I miss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess this is as much home now as, as any place is. But uh, right. who am I? That's the question I'm still answering, I guess. And I think every column that I write perhaps reveals a little bit more of who I am. Sometimes it reveals the things that have me confused. Sometimes it reveals the things that have me angry or right. pleased. Uh, that's not as often, I guess, as I'm, <laughs> as I'm being angry. But um, at the same time, I think I would hope that the column does reflect something about myself that people Were accept. Were you gracious enough to expose so much of your thinking and who you are? Because you went to college in Carolina? What was that? I went to college in St. Louis. In St. Uh, Louis. Washington University in St. Louis. And I graduated from there with a degree in English Lit. And uh, wait, I, wait, what made you go into English lit? Let's see if you can go back a little bit. I, I tell people sometimes there's the real story and the official story. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I actually started school in engineering program, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I went to school, I had graduated from the Mississippi School for Mathematics and Science, which, okay. as the name suggests, has a very uh, yeah. math science focus. And so I went to college uh, convinced that I was going to do something medical related, perhaps something like what you do, or okay. be a doctor. And, um, but I, en I entered the engineering program, uh, still thinking maybe biomedical engineering, maybe something in combining medicine, engineering, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But they require all of the incoming freshmen uh, in the engineering program to take an English proficiency exam. And the only reason you're to take this exam is to basically test out so you won't have to take any more English classes okay. for the rest of your college career. Okay. And I flunked it. Right. <laughs> and right. I, I, I'm telling them, look, I was raised by an English teacher. I've never gotten anything less than A's in English right. my entire school career. Right. And I remember the dean being so con condescending. Well, this is college now. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was dragged, really, kicking and screaming into okay. English composition. Okay. And I got there, I was like, wait, you know what? This is actually what I most enjoy doing. Okay. Doing math and science, although I had some proficiency in it, felt like a responsibility. Okay. Like I was, you know, I had to do this for black people. Like right. you have to make black people proud yeah, right, and become right, an right. engineer right. or become something else that's technical right. in this way. Right. But English and writing and reading were the things that I most enjoyed. Okay. And so at a certain point, the question to me became, do you do what people expect you to do or do you do what you like doing? Okay. And so I made that decision to do what I like to do. Uh, and it caused a little bit of concern from some people in my family. Do you really want to switch, you know, from this reliably high paying field to a field that may lead you, you know, I don't want my daughter scraping to see, for work. I don't want my daughter to see this interview. <laughs> <laughs> she would never tell. But you know, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's the, it's the same for everybody. I mean, right. it, and, and, and it, I think, there are two kind of conflicting ideas that people have about college and have about education. I think some people see it squarely as about becoming employable okay. and you want this degree in order to get some other job. Okay. For me, at least I tried to 
maybe by circumstances more than choice, I try to see it as, okay, what do I really enjoy doing? How can I become the more complete Jarvis? And I, I remember having a conversation with an uncle of mine who was a PhD, PhD in political science, but he was really a little distraught that I was, you know, <laughs> leaving the math and science area for uh, English lit, and I told him, I said, when I leave college, mm -hmm. I want to be broader. I want to be a more expansive person. And I said, when I'm in the engineering program, I feel myself getting narrower and narrower and narrower. You're focusing on, you're shutting everything else out in the world and focusing on this little bit. You seem to be nodding in recognition of, <laughs> of what it's like studying science in college. Okay. Right. But that was kind of important to me. I didn't want to leave college and know less about the world okay. than I went in knowing. And I felt like some of those degree programs, even though you were become proficient in one particular area, mm -hmm. you were not necessarily becoming conversant in the topics that were going on in the world. So that's how I uh, decided to, uh, to enter the English field. And then my senior year, my mother calls me on the phone. And she said, um, yeah, uh, people have been asking me, what are you going to do after graduation? And I said, people, Ma? It's, <laughs> it's people who've been asking you this? And uh, really, I did not know really anything about the Times Picayune, but I went to the uh, career office on my campus, and they had a list of places that had internships for newspapers, and that was one of them. I was dating this girl who was going to Dillard, so why not? You know, why not? Why not apply to the one in New Orleans? And uh, I got hired here, and it's, I've been here ever since. That is too deep. <laughs> well, you asked, so that's you no, got, the, no, you got the, the full answer. No, the thing, I mean, every part of the story. I mean, you know, kids walk into that, you know, and yeah. Right away, believe me, I can't let my, you know, we've had that conversation at our house all the time. Yeah. You know, what you're telling them they need yeah. to go into and what they want to go into. Yeah. And then also, even uh, bigger than that, everybody will uh, love the part about met a girl from Dillard and then up in New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> Something about the girls from New Orleans. That, <laughs> oh, well. That's, that's deep. Yeah. But that is... Uh, that is real. So you actually started right after graduation. Yeah, I um, started here in May 1997. So I graduated in May, started in May. And I started uh, as an intern, uh, was on the West Bank in the West Bank Bureau. Uh, when I got hired full time, my first position was out in Laplace in the River Parishes. Right. From there, I went to St. Tammany Parish and covered uh, courts in St. Tammany Parish. Okay. And then I got hired to the editorial page uh, after that. So I've been doing that since around 2000 or so. I know, and you talk a lot about your family and, and those influences and yeah. the uncles and, and, yeah. and so forth. And I would assume now when you go home to the family reunions, people have a different view of your choice. Yeah, I think they do. I, 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 that, that uncle in particular, I think, kind of said, okay, well. And, and he respected my choice when I was talking to him. It wasn't an opposition to it, but it was just a little bit of concern. Are, are you sure that this is, this is the right path? And uh, I do think that I've made my family proud, and, and that's, that's something I can hang my hat on. That is fantastic. I think yeah. it's, uh, uh, it, it's a great story. Um, for young people that are making that choice um, on where they need to go. But those things formed your philosophy because when we read your column, we can see what, you know, um, so much of uh, the things that you learn coming through and um, yeah. your faith is powerful throughout your columns. Uh, yeah. Those things, it, it's, uh, you get attacked for it, but I think it's solid. Yeah, you know, a, a part of, uh, a good column, I think, is risking yourself and um, really deciding how much you're going to reveal about yourself and, um, and, and putting yourself out there. And what, what I discovered is that people, generally speaking, 
and I, I mean this across the board, are not comfortable with publicly expressing their opinions. Right. And that's something that kind of surprises me and shocks me in some way, but I've seen it repeated over and over again. Like we used to be in the office where letters to the editor would be produced and, and published and prepared for publication. And there were people would call on the phone and say, uh, I want to write this letter to the editor, but could you not put my name on it? And it would be something like, I want the potholes on my street fit. Something completely non-controversial. Right. But they had this idea that if somebody knows that I have this position, then I'm going to be in some type of trouble or I'm going to have to pay some type of consequences for having my position. I really don't think maybe unless you work for the streets department itself, that you're going to get in trouble for saying, I want, <laughs> I want the potholes of my street fix. But things such as that, I discovered that people are generally uncomfortable with walking out on the stage, as it were, and saying, this is what I think about a particular issue. And um, it's not the easiest thing, I think, even for people like us who are columnists who do it. I mean, it's something that we have to kind of get used to doing. But it doesn't come naturally, I don't think, to anybody. Most, most of us are pretty, I think, afraid of saying what we think about matters. It's interesting because um, I always think about New Orleans and, and the culture here, uh, which you're definitely 97 deeply in the grain, yeah. you know, and family and so forth. So, and, uh, and you write, you, uh, with that authority, as literally as a New Orleanian. Uh, but you have a civil rights background in your family. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, from an early age, the idea of opposition to things that were unjust was a part of it. And I can't say, it would be wrong for me to say that I understood the, the width and breadth of that when I was a kid, because I really did not. I did not know that my uncle was as courageous as he was. Uh, and, and honestly, I tell people, my colleagues can tell you all the time, I'm 40 now and I'm still learning stuff about my uncle. Wow. Like I learned this year of the role he played in taking over an administration building at Brandeis <laughs> University in 1969, right? It was published in the New York Times and in um, the Boston Globe, and so uh, I was, I was working. I never really got to do this particular column earlier this year, last year, but I was thinking about what is our reaction to student protesters that we see in Missouri and at Princeton and at Yale and other places. What do we think about them? What is the media saying about them? So I was like, oh, I wonder, you know, what. You know, they were saying about the, the protest that my uncle was a part of, and I get this big stack of articles in which he was um, was included. So yeah, I'm 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 still learning about uh, that history, but my folks, my, you know, at least on my dad's side, are from Holly Springs, Mississippi, um, and there was a Freedom School set up in town in 1964, and my uncle Roy was uh, a part of that Freedom School and uh, was jailed, like so many other folks were, for uh, civil rights protests. Uh, ended up going to Brandeis University, where he helped lead a, a takeover <laughs> of the administration <laughs> building, among other things, while getting three degrees in political science. Wow. But I will say this, it, it, even though I wasn't as fully aware of a civil rights background in my family as I probably should have been, one of the things that has encouraged me and has uh, given me some comfort as I'm writing is just knowing what people in this city went through and did. Like, I often see Jerome Smith walking around New Orleans. I mean, he is available for the people to just approach and talk and have conversations with. You know, Dodie Smith, and uh, I go to church with uh, Katrina Endang, who was uh, along that group with Dodie. And I talk to these people and I see these people and I know that they suffered physical punishment 
for their opinions and beliefs and they were put in jail and they may have been ostracized and denied schooling or employment or et cetera because of whatever position they took. So dealing with commenters after all that, it's like, huh, this is no big deal. You know, I, like I didn't get beaten up like Jerome Smith <laughs> right, did. Right, I didn't right. get spat on like right. other people did. Right. And so really understanding and remembering what other people did who have risked so much more physically, emotionally, financially, you know, it doesn't seem to me to be as scary after all of that to say, you know, I think this is wrong or I think this should be changed. Now, is that the same political science PhD uncle? Yes, yes, okay. yeah, so that's, I mean, I think, I think those, those experiences in Mississippi uh, funneled him into that uh, field of political science. I mean, he was a part of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, was, uh, with Fannie Lou Hamer when they were at the Democratic Convention wow. demanding, you know, to be the real delegation uh, for Mississippi. So, yeah, the, the history is good, but, but one of the things I have to say is that he never really harped on it or, you know, and, and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it was never a sense of, well, I did all these things and so you need to do all these things. But it is with the realization that those things have been done and that people took stances that, as I said, makes it somewhat easier to take stances in a, in a column. Well, uh, now the column itself, though, and uh, your, your push of, of, of the direction that you're going, um, it's obvious, though, uh, your beliefs are, are strong. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. My wife will say that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so are hers, I must say. So, it's, okay. so it's, we're often having long conversations, <laughs> i put it that way. Okay, okay. Yeah, and, and, and so um, uh, the positions that you take, yeah. uh, which they are positions, um, uh, they, they carry a weight to them. At 40 years old, I may say also, they, yeah. they carry a weight, they carry an intellectual weight uh, to present an argument that uh, many times the opposition um, is forced to just call names and <laughs> just go beneath. Yeah, I don't think you're ever forced to call names, but I, I think that an unfortunate uh, kind of phenomenon that we are seeing now is that people are either less likely or less capable, I don't know which is the case, of engaging in an intellectual debate. And I see it all the time even, I mean, it, it's not just online, you also see it on television and news shows. I tell people, I've never watched a cable news show and had people pitted against one another where somebody says, oh, I see your point. Or, you know what, you're right, I'm wrong. I, it, you, you never, ever see it. And it right. it's like the whole idea now, it seems, is that people are supposed to get out and shout each other and talk over each other and call people idiots and, and all kinds of idiots and, and morons. And so uh, I think we see a lot of that, too, on social media and we see a lot of it on uh, internet websites, including Nolo.com, where people think it is okay or acceptable to just name call and ridicule uh, one another. Uh, when I was first hired as an editorial writer, my editor told me, your job is to persuade. And I, I try to take that to heart and I try to take that seriously. Now there are times I know that I'm not going to be able to persuade the people who I would like to persuade. Uh, but at the same time, I am trying to, if, if I can't persuade them, at least then I can state my opinion strongly. Okay, now, you're an African American male, all right? Um, not ashamed to be an African American male. Very proud of that. Uh, it's obvious in the columns. Um, uh, family man, 
a Christian. Those values you can, are very solid in your writing. Yeah. Uh, but that makes you a minority. <laughs> In some ways, yes, but not in all ways. And and I, I, I could would probably tell you that there are a lot of ways that I don't agree with what a lot of Black people say or do or think. And in a lot of ways, I would don't disagree, don't agree with what a lot of men say and do and think. And in a lot of ways, I probably don't agree with a lot of Christians say and do and think. True. And so um, I try not to just kind of like toe the line where this group believes this so Jarvis has to take that position right, right? I tried to to be more thoughtful than that and to be more than just an identity but not be ashamed of that identity either and to perhaps when I can show the diversity within particular identities so um, it is not I, I I tell people that my job as a columnist is to be consistent without being predictable. So it would not be right for me to take a position that was at odds with the position I took last week. But at the same time, I don't want you reading this week the same column you read last week, right? Okay, okay. <laughs> so, so it needs to be something new, something interesting, something thoughtful without being you can write it in your head before, before I even write it myself. Yeah, but the uh, but fact is, though, uh, to have an African-American male uh, intellectual Christian in this particular position during this time, uh, during the monument struggle, during the uh, struggles over the teachers and poverty and every other issue yeah. where New Orleans is a hotbed of every issue yeah. in, in the world. It seems as though we're like the, yeah. the melting pot for it. Um, uh, the fact that you do hold true to those specific beliefs um, it would take a crowbar to flip you out. You know what I mean? It would, it would be disingenuous yeah, to take you yeah. out of and those. I, I, I do try to stay true to the people. I know that can sound different ways, can have different meaning to different people. But uh, I, I don't take it lightly, let me put it that way. I don't take it lightly that I am one of the few people out here doing this, not just in New Orleans, but across the country, That's you know, and, and that is, it can be both a blessing and a burden, because there have been times, my wife can tell you, I will say, I do not want to write about this. <laughs> I really do not want to write about this. But either because of that identity that you mentioned, or because I've written about something similar before, or whatever the case may be, it is, I feel like it's necessary, that it would be cheating if I did not or cheating if I took a pass on this particular thing. And so, um, so there are times it's like, it's, it's kind of hard to give myself the courage to do uh, what I would like to do. Uh, and one of the things I want to do at least is to keep challenging my fears and keep challenging, uh, keep challenging myself. Personally, off the page, I tend to want people to like me. Really, like most people do, I think. You know, and yet when I'm writing, I have to fight that idea that I'm doing this to be liked because I'm really not doing it to be liked. And so, you know, if I know that this is going to upset people, and at the same time, I don't want to write something solely to make people not like me either. You know, I'm not trying to just provoke people for, for the sake of provoking them. Uh, some of my critics sometimes accuse me of that, but it's really not the case. I don't try to write anything to be more provocative just because I'm gonna upset somebody. Uh, that, that, that doesn't interest me at all. Well, um, the weight of it is obvious. Uh, the uh, particularly in this day and time, the opposition is obvious. Yeah, in, in a sense, um, but that begs the next question: um, 
how do you feel that being in this position with the so-called future of our country and future of this city, the more the challenges come, the heavier the weight falls on the position that yeah, that, that's one of the reasons I mentioned the people I mentioned before, whether it was Jerome Smith or Miss Doty or Miss Katrina and you know all the other people. I think of the people before who bore that responsibility without complaint. You know, to my knowledge, Jerome Smith has never complained about being the one who took the beatings or being the one who, you know, got put in jail, and so. I, I try to the best of my ability not to focus on the burden in, in, that, in that sense um, and just to kind of play my part and to, and to play my role. And I understand, I, I'll, I'll be the first to admit this, that, that, that the columnist position is not as consequential, I don't think, as other people, whether they're people on the streets who are activists or uh, whether there are some of the people in other positions of leadership or uh, clergy or otherwise. That there are a lot of people out here doing a lot of things and sometimes I feel that I have the most risk-free position of all of those. That I'm not generally risking imprisonment <laughs> for my positions and I'm not risking getting fired and I'm not risking losing jobs or that type of thing. And so when I try to keep that in perspective, it, again, is one of those things. If, you, if you've noticed, I'm constantly looking for sources of encouragement, <laughs> as I think perhaps all columnists are, but you're constantly looking for reasons to, to walk through the fear or to go through the fear. Well, I hope you do know as we close that uh, of the commenters who are the 99%, I do believe that there's much more that they're a small minority to the people who are rooting you on every day. They may not place comments in, but they accept Yeah, yeah, I, and I do get a lot of people, and uh, there was this one woman in particular who used to go to my church, and she was an 80-year-old black woman who would always tell me how, much, how proud she was of me, and that makes everything good. It, it, all the comments could have nothing compared to that. Mr. Jarvis DeBerry, fight as hard as you can. <laughs> We're thankful for this young man and what he's doing. But you keep on pushing, you keep fighting, never stop. Thank you.